so i think we should we should start minding the false impression that uh, time always creates that we have plenty first of all and it's already uh, uh, 9:31 and we must not waste time first of all conforming to the weather outside at kamarpukur where i am at present a sunny good morning to one and all however i am quite unsure of the weather of the different parts of the state where from we proud to have our interested audience i want to introduce myself i am devan banerjee assistant professor and head department of english chai pat sohid pradut bhattacharya mahavidyalay on behalf of the department and the college i heartily welcome you all today is a day one of our online lecture series entitled text in focus 2021 we are pleased to inform you that our respected tic ma'am has already joined us other teaching non teaching staffs are also there with us so are our most beloved students thank you all today we are thrilled to have in our midst professor amit bhattacharya head department of english university of gorbongo sir is my research supervisor sir will deliver lecture on an introduction a representative poem of komola das we are quite lucky that from his busy schedule sir has managed time for us sir has done his masters and his phd from the university of north bengal the title of his dissertation was the poetics of resistance a study of marginal voices in the poetry of komola das so it's almost self evident that we heartily requested sir to deliver at least one lecture on the poem <laughs> sir has over 20 years of experience in teaching and research he has attended quite a number of seminars and conferences at the national and international levels and contributed more than 30 articles to journals and anthologies of critical articles in india and abroad the areas of his research interest include marginality studies stoma studies and intersectionality studies he has received the prestigious sikhar odno award in 2019 from the government of west bengal in recognition of his contribution to the field of higher studies and higher education for uh, coming to sir uh, i just uh, i actually on behalf of the department and the college want to add few points here we are happy to inform you that we have seven or eight lectures in the pipeline on texts and issues uh including indian classical literature my uh, partisan literature detective fiction so on and so forth uh and we are going to host uh, the lectures on the alternative days uh you will be get notification the title of the series is text in focus 2021 the focus though will primarily be on the text the series would address and analyze border ramifications of the very word text every text is interestingly intertwined with society its people uh, their ideology their way of living their thought etc and sir will obviously elucidate the idea after the lecture we have a brief question answer session and i uh, encourage and insist the uh, attentive audience here to ask question after the session followed by vote of thanks to be delivered by susmita banerji faculty department of english फोकस and i have chosen as a topic of my discussion kamala dash's poem and introduction now i have tentatively titled the discussion as i to call myself i 
borrowing a line from the poem in focus. And it is going to be a close reading of the poem and introduction, which was first published in Kamala Dasha's first volume of poems, Summer in Calcutta, which was published in 1965. So I would like Shunandita to go to slide number two. We all know that the fact that an introduction is there on your syllabus means that this poem is considered to be one of the representative poems of Kamala Das as the esteemed teacher in charge has pointed out. In fact, this is the most anthologized poem of Kamala Das. You know, this is a key poem in any discussion of Kamala Das's poetry because not only does it address most of the concerns of Kamala Das, as a poet, but also because it connects giving the lie to Eliot's draconian bifurcation of the man who suffers and the mind which creates. This poem links the life and literature of Kamdadas. As a result, Kamaladash, you all know, was born in 1934 and died in 2009. So the poem and introduction was published when the poet was 31 years old. So in a way, it is an introduction. It is an introduction to Kamala Das the person and Kamala Das the poet. And we'll see when we read the poem that there are autobiographical touches, autobiographical elements in this poem, Galur. It is called a poetic manifesto because like preface to the lyrical ballads by William Wordsworth, like modern fiction by Virginia Woolf, for example, or tradition and the individual talent by T.S. Eliot. This particular poem also, even though it is, it is not a, a critical text in that sense of the term, it actually prefigures the concerns and the poetic agenda that the poet Kamala Das had. Now, if you see, I have used another term, which may be a bit new to all of you. That is autogenography. We all know about autobiography. Autobiography is the record of the life of a person. He or she may be a writer, or not a writer. That is not the case question here. Autobiography seems to suggest that the person who is recording his or her own life has a unified self. Now, feminist writers and critics have often tried to point out that the female self is diffused. Gender roles and gender expectations. The biological factor of motherhood. All these things determine that often the female self is dissipated and diffused. And with this insight, Domna Stanton 
has mooted the idea of autogenography. We all know geno is here associated with the female. So in a way, it is the record of the life of a woman penned by a woman and taking into consideration the myriad contingent configurations of her diffused selves and identities. Now, even though Dr. Chakravarti had pointed out that she was not going to talk too much about the poem, she has given me a very, very helpful slew of clues that will help me no end in pointing out the nitty gritties of this poem. Similarly, Devan Banerjee has also pointed out the textuality of these literary works of which I am going to tackle one, that is an introduction. Twentieth century has bolstered the belief and the conviction that text cannot be read in a void. Contexts are there, whether we like them or not. Social, intellectual, political, and so on and so forth. So, we have to understand that this poem was written by Kamala Dash in the 1960s. 17 or 18 years after India's independence. By referring to Nehru, our first prime minister, Kamala Dash categorically dates the poem. So the context is and the contexts are those of the 1960s. I will come back to this and I will now request Shunamdita to go to slide number three. You know, let us begin reading the poem. The title of this slide is Politics, Knowledge and Participation. I will enlist the assistance of Gaurav Guho, one of the students of the Department of English, University of Gurugram, PG Semester 4, who will read out the relevant portions of the poem. Gaurav. I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with Nehru. Okay. Now, I have already circulated a preparatory worksheet among the students. And I told them to point out and highlight pronouns, verbs, and verb phrases. Now, I had a particular reason for that. Now, Kamala Das begins with a very, very bold statement. Bold and yet honest as Dr. Chakravarti has pointed out. Shahoshi emotion. I don't know politics, but know the names of those in power. And using the simile, like days of the week or names of months, 
beginning with Mary. As we go along, we will understand that the speaker is a woman persona, the persona of the poet, Kamalakas. So I don't know politics does not mean merely that it is a rejection of politics, a political identity. Rather, it points out a nefarious design of patriarchy. Women are neither expected to know politics, nor are they accepted in the domain of politics. But they can repeat. Repeat the names of those in power. Obviously, this act of repetition has to be consequent upon the free act, the act of free will of the male counterparts. The males can know politics. They can participate in politics. Women are excluded from the political sphere, even though their lives are also governed by politics. But you know, repetition is the way you learn something. When we were kids, we repeated the written word and the spoken word. And thereby we learn to read. So repetition very, very subtly empowers. So today who repeats may tomorrow subvert the exclusivist discourse of Indian politics. And beginning with Nehru becomes very, very important in this context. Because Nehru was at the head of those in power. But I will try to revisit this point. Please go to the next slide. Go to the title of this slide is Self Uh, identification. In a way, she is introducing herself. So it is a self-introduction. This self-introduction places and situates Kamala. She has done it temporarily earlier. Now, she is doing it culturally as well as specially. Over to you, Gaurav. I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Okay. I am Indian, born in Malabar, in South India. Very brown. So, the national identity, the location, as well as the ethnicity of the poet speaker is pointed out. Very, very categorical. Even her linguistic competence is pointed out. I speak three languages, Tamil, Malayalam, and English. Right into Malayalam and English. Let me tell you that Kamala Das was a bilingual writer who wrote prose fiction and memoir in Malayalam and prose, poetry, drama, criticism, memoir, and so on and so forth in English as well. But the enigmatic part of this particular section is the question of dream. 
dream in one. Now, <coughs> excuse me. This question of dream is paramount, of paramount in significance. Why? Because we, as students of humanities and students of literature, cannot forget two things. Two speeches, one by Nehru at the independence of India, the tryst with destiny speech, a dream, a dream that a young nation, a newly independent nation is going to realize the dream. At least they, the Indians will try hard to realize their dream. And because this poem was published in 1965, we cannot actually shut our eyes to another epoch-making speech delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. I have a dream. Martin Luther King was a civil rights activist. He was talking about the economic and civil rights of the black the marginalized section of the U.S. population. And the subject position of Kamala Daj, the poet, is also that of someone who is a subaltern, who is a marginalized poet and a marginalized person. Margin marginalized because she's a woman. Marginalized because she is a very brown woman, we all know that surreptitiously we all think of applying fair and lovely or fair. So light skin is always something to be coveted and that is a socio-cultural reality or given. So you see, The idea of dreaming in one, in, in, in an interview, Kamala Dash has pointed out that he had English in her mind. So she dreamt in English. Why? People like Keki and Darwala has actually, uh, they, they have poked fun. They have pointed out that dreaming in English is a snobbish statement. But here, the activist side of Kamala Dash cannot be ignored. The fact that she was Indian and not an Indian as the native speakers of English would like to point out, not only points out the Indianization of English as Bruce King has indicated, but also situates Kamala Dash. So whatever he, she says, whatever she thinks, and whatever she dreams are all to be contextualized with the help of this. English gave Kamala Dash the chance of going beyond the merely Indian to connecting with the cosmic all, with the world outside. And in, an, in a multilingual country like India, torn asunder by the debate of Tamil and Hindi, we all know that after independence, there was a big fight. Hindi was almost forcibly imposed upon India, but because, as an official language, but because the southern states objected, English was also kept on. So English is very, very important in the Indian context. It was important then, and it is also important now. 
वट एवर द रिवाइवल मे से इंग्लिश इज इम्पोर्टेंट एंड एज ए रिजल्ट ड्रीमिंग इन वन becomes not only tenable but also essential as nirod si choudhury has pointed out that we love our solar system but we are also entranced by the distant stars it's not that we don't love india it's not that we don't love the indian vernacular languages but at the same time the possibility of connecting with a wider audience with a wider readership is something that we cannot ignore let's go to the next slide please and here we will see a poet's apology a poet a person who spoke in three languages wrote in two and dreamt in one is forbidden to write in english why because this is not her mother tongue so obviously it becomes clear that she does write in english okay go now read it don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue why not leave me alone pretty just wait Okay, don't write in English. Who said they? Who are these persons? Obviously, the categorizers. One of the questions that I had set to help you prepare for this session was how many times is the word categorizers used and why? why do you think yes the word has been used once directly but the word has been hinted at throughout the poem they are the norm givers the cultural categorizers the social categorizers the elders of the family and so on and so forth all are working under the sway of supremacist discourses like patriarchy like patriotism like ethnocentrism and so on and so forth yes i am using certain words that may be a difficult a bit difficult for you to understand but i as a teacher think that you should try to find out you should try to contextualize you should try to participate in the meaning making exercise that the teacher and the students are parts of the acharyo and the shishyo while studying brahmo vidya should cooperate and only then and then can the teaching learning process be complete so i will dare you i will challenge you after this session please look up these words patriarchy you know patriotism you know ethnocentrism an opinion that ethnicity jat pat dharma religion race caste language location all these things and physical features we all know the aryan features and the dravidian features and the austic features are different and indians being members of a mixed race indians may have aryan features light skin and sharp features or dravidian features dark skin and in many cases 
a bit blunt features and all that. So obviously, you have to understand that the question that because English is not the mother tongue of this poet, this upstart, she has to be forced to avoid writing in English. But in a subtle way, the command is twofold. Don't write in English subsumes, includes two commands. Don't write because you are a woman. And don't write it in English because you are a, an Indian woman. Why? Because writing means fighting. Writing back means fighting back and patriarchy over the ages. Has always tried to deny that particular empowering agency to women. Okay, coming back, do you think that Kamala Dash or the poetic persona will cow down? Will she leave? Will she desist from writing or writing in English? Come on, she's game. Kamala Dash does not backtrack. Rather, she starts her rejoinder that will go on even in the next slide. Okay, let's first read this particular portion. Why not leave me alone? I just buzz off. Go to hell. Why are you bothering? Why are you poking your dirty nose into my appearance? Whatever language I choose, whether I choose to write or shut up, that is my problem, not yours. Why not leave me alone? Critics, friends, visiting cousins. Why not let me use the language I choose? So who actually... Tell her not to write or not to write in English? Critics. Critics like Buddhadev Boshu, critics like Jyotir Moy Dotto, and even Vasha writers during the Nimrana controversy. We all know that. You know, this particular issue, whether Indians should write only in vernacular languages spoken in India, or they should also write, or they can write in English as well. This has actually baffled critics and writers. And often, Indian writers who use English for their literary creation, they have been criticized, debunked, looked down upon as being parasitic, or OGB. You are not English, so why are you using English? You are being snobbish. These are the things that many have pointed out. And you know, post-colonialism has taught us that in newly independent countries, often the drift of social and cultural opinion is to go back to pre-colonial times. Because English was the erstwhile master's speech. Many pointed out, not only then, but also now, that English should be discarded. And this is not an Indian phenomenon as a, a, only. People like Ungugi Wathiango in Africa, a famous writer, has also pointed this out. Many have pointed this out. They have tried to even abolish the English department. So what I am trying to point out is the bold and honest way that Kamala Dash 
defends her choice of english in one of her interviews to pp rabindran she said what do you expect should i write in sarbo croat or in swahili i don't know those languages english being common english being the language i know i use it full stop okay it may be queer it may be half english half indian but it is honest let's go to the next slide now here the woman persona tries to point out that there are two component parts to the literary production that she usually produces anisur rahman has pointed out that there should not be anything demeaning about the fact that her language her poetic language is half indian and half english she is an indian woman but she is writing in english so obviously the linguistic literary component of her poetry is english but at the same time the question of sensibility should not be ignored and as a result we cannot ignore or underestimate the indian side and for her to write in english is as natural as coin is to the crows and roaring to the lions because this is the speech of a mind that is aware the mind of a sentient being the mind of a person and a poet who can adapt herself to the situations that she finds herself in not the haphazard sound made by the monsoon clouds or the trees in the storm or the mutterings of a funeral pyre i hope you understand this much now till this point in her poem kamala dash has talked about herself and her choice to write in english write and write in english now helen sisu has pointed out that a woman has to write woman just as man has to write man so as a woman poet kamala dash is going to address things and issues that she finds important as a woman the gender identity is something that cannot be ignored or wished away so now in the arbitrarily divided second section of the poem that i have actually put before you for the sake of our convenience we will read about kamala dash the person why is it important as a part of this particular poetic manifesto because whatever kamala dash writes is to a large extent determined by determined by what experience or experiences she has encountered in her life okay next slide please go to read i was child yes. yes i was child yes go on and later they told me i grew for i became tall my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair wait i was child again just like i am indian here also zero article is used indianization of english i was not a child 
Here I was child. That is what Kamaladas writes. Why? This is the mother tongue interference, MTR. When we speak in Bengali or Hindi for that matter, because these are the two Indian languages that I am comfortable with. We say, I am Bachasila. Or, I was a child. I was a child. So obviously, we do not use articles in such assertions. So I was a child. Now, child is a gender neutral term. When I, I call someone a child, I do not express whether that person is a male child or a female child. But later, what happens? They told me that I grew. So my growth is monitored by society. Again, they, this is very important. And look at it. I have highlighted this day. day. It is red. Because it is the norm givers. The Matobars, Murubis, who actually decide what we can do and what we cannot do. Who could say, don't write in English? Who decides? So they are the those in power. Those in power. Okay, they are the powerful ones. They give the norms. Bidhan Dayajara. So I was a child, but later they told me that I grew. And how is that growth monitored? How is that growth measured? On physical terms. I became tall. Certain parts of my body swelled. And some parts sprouted here, pubic here, because now the child is becoming a gendered being, a woman. The onset of puberty is here. Okay. So, this is monitored by society. And we all know in, in, in society, even today in 2021, when a girl, there are many girl students over here, you know, that when you grow up, the first thing that is mooted against you by this patriarchal society is, In this, the consent of the girl is neither accepted, Nor is it considered to be important. Okay, read it. When I asked for love, not knowing what else to ask for, he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. Okay. You know, when I asked for love, Acha, what do you ask for usually? Usually we ask for things that we don't have. So when I ask for love, not knowing what else to ask for, I asked for, I, I wanted, I craved, I begged culture, I begged society, I begged my family to give me something. Because love was the need of the hour. What did he do? And who is he? He is a representative of the day. The categorizers. Now, in a family, in a patriarchal society, in a family, who usually is the male pronoun he? Obviously, the father figure. And the father figure, he, now do remember this, there are many other types of he's. He drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. 
So obviously the context is that of premature marriage. The girl is even younger. Even the bridegroom is 16 years old. Even he is underage. So please try to understand. It is customary to find faults only with the male. But we have to understand that the male is as much a pawn of patriarchy, a pawn of culture, as is the woman. Certain things are programmed into you. What are the programmed things? When you grow up, when you will uh, be uh, in your postgraduate courses, you will hear about Althusser and the ideological state apparatuses. You will talk about conditioned power as Kenneth Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith will talk about. Then please do remember this. The youth is conditioned to do certain things. Shaw had once called marriage legalized prostitution. So marriage means sex. And because both the bride and the bridegroom are young, they are underage. So obviously it is premature sex that may only result in premature pregnancy and premature motherhood. When neither the boy nor the girl, neither the bride nor the bridegroom will be prepared, matured enough to understand and bear the burden that these things entail. And here, another thing is important. I have given the title from freedom to bondage. When she was child, she was free. But when she became a woman, all doors were closed. So the gesture of closing the door of the bedroom by the autocratic male figure, the father figure, means that most of the avenues of freedom are denied to the young bride from now. Let's go to the next slide, please. It's very queer. The reality of marriage is very queer. Why is it so? Read it. Go up. He did not beat me, but my sad woman body feels so beaten. The weight Just, of my what does it mean? What does it mean? He did not beat me. Now, who is this he figure? Think about it. The space is the bedroom. The door is closed. And the youth of 16, a male, has been drawn into this particular room. So who will be the he figure? No prizes for guessing it. It is the husband figure. The husband figure did not beat the bride. The bridegroom did not beat the bride as if, as if, how afraid, how baffled, how puzzled the speaker is. You can very easily understand that she even suspects that he, that is the husband figure, could have beaten her. So the fact that she, he did not beat her is uttered is recorded with a kind of a sense of relief. But even though there was no physical beating, wife beating, there was something that was, if not more than, at least same as beating. Because the consequences were disastrous for the female. 
both physically and psychologically. Why? Because my woman body felt so bitter. Overuse. You may read a poem by Kamala Das, The Seven Ages of Woman. I will strongly suggest. And the, the weight of my breasts and my womb crushed me. The male figure had sex with her. Why? Because he was expected to have sex with her. He was programmed by patriarchy. He was programmed by society. He was programmed by culture to have sex with her. And the result was premature pregnancy. Swollen and sagging breasts. Childbirth. Crushing. Painful. Traumatic. As a result, she shrank pitiful. Now, this shrinking is not only somatic, it is not physical, it is also psychological. I will tell you to read another poem The Old Playhouse by Kamala Dashi. Cowering beneath your monstrous ego. It is the, the, the speaker is the woman figure, the, the, the wife. And your obviously means the husband figure. Cowering beneath your monstrous ego, I ate the magic loaf and became a dwarf. So the magic loaf is the symbol of cultural norms and became a dwarf. A woman, as Dr. Chakrabot was pointing out, gets a raw deal from society in marriage. Even though she had asked for love, she had never bargained for these things. Love meant only that. But love here degenerates to lust and results in marriage, uh, in pregnancy and mother. So obviously, this shrinking, even though very pitiable, is natural. Let's go to the next slide, please. Read it. Then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers, cut my hair short, and ignored my womanliness. Gora, what is the title of this slide? Read it. Longing and belonging. Yes. So there is longing. We want certain things and we have to belong to particular places. This title will be explained when we have read this particular slide. Now, what have we understood about the speaker? She's a woman. She's a marginalized woman. But is it, it, is, is it the some total of our knowledge. No. She is a woman. She is a marginalized woman. But she is also a resilient woman. She doesn't throw in the towel. She doesn't surrender. She fights. Fights patriarchy back in his, its own way. Now here, Amunadash is being very, very subtle. She says, recalling her own life, that when she was crushed by the weight of motherhood. She tried to ignore her womanliness. Now, many critics have pointed out this. This is actually, according to them, a concealment, an act of concealment, just as uh, Shakespeare's heroines like Rosaline, like Portia, or like Viola in Twelfth Night had tried to avert male disguise and got power thereby. Does this act of wearing your hair short or putting on the trousers and shirt of her brother, 
is it an attempt at concealment or is it an attempt to ignore now sometimes what cannot be cured has to be endured and the only way possible to endure certain bad things obnoxious things undesirable thing is to forget or to ignore we ignore pain we ignore social ostracism all kinds of marginalization sometimes for our mental peace but just as the woman is resilient patriarchy is also relentless patriarchy very easily culture very easily sees through this so again in the categorizers cry out they cry out what do they cry out what do they say read dress in sarees be girl be wife they said wait so dress in sarees don't dress in your in male attire be girl be wife you are a girl you are a woman you are a wife so don't do something that is not conducive to your identity as a wife as a woman who decides again patriarchy culture okay go on be embroiderer be cook be a quarreler with servants fit in oh belong cried the categorizers wait so what does the categorizer tell her to do earlier they have told her not to write and not to write in english now they tell her to become a wife again to dwindle into a wife i am reminded of the proviso sin in uh, um, the way of the world you will read it so they are telling you to be an embroiderer here you will hear about these things my dear uh, students gender roles and gender expectations persons of every gender masculine or feminine or whatever they are expected to play certain roles and not to play certain other roles <coughs> big boys are not supposed to cry women girls are not supposed to cry or speak very loudly or to sit cross legged and all those things you know dress in a particular way and, and and come back home before the sun sets and all that so there are certain things that are acceptable as your activities okay don't write but you can you can you can embroider that is also creative you do do that you can cook again oh you all know that sanjeev kapoor has taught us how lucrative and how 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 um satisfying even cooking can be and and be a quarreler with servants so if you are angry don't vent your anger upon your superiors or the husband figure or your or elders or the family members you can quarrel but quarrel with your inferiors your servants often patriarchy actually deceives women by giving the, them the dubious title oh you are the boss at home okay we also do that but hereby patriarchy not only delegates certain bits of responsibility onto the shoulder of the women 
but also they actually become free of those responsibilities so it is not only it is not only empowerment it is also escapism okay be a poor man with cooked you have to choose a role and a name because names are indicative of your gender names are indicative of what gender you belong to now i will go back to something that i had left the categorizer said often uh, at one time told her to be ami to be komola or better still to be madhavi why did they say so ami is the pet name and in the army Kamala is her official name, and Madhavi Kutty is Kamala Das's pseudonym. When she wrote um, prose fiction in Malayalam, she used to uh, use this pen name. So society actually tries to categorize. Society tries to constrict women to a particular name and a particular role. so women are some kind of lesser men they cannot be human beings that is what patriarchy tries to point out okay read on yes or belong cried the categorizers sir next slide yes yes cried the categorizers you see before we go to the next slide we have to understand at this juncture that these ends the description of the married life the second section of the poem so the categorizers are relentless but you know the woman persona is also resilient and it is now that i am going to go to the next slide title loves ecstasy yes read don't sit on walls or peep in through our lace draped windows be amy or be kamla or better still be madhavi kutti it is time to choose a name a road don't play pretending games don't play at schizophrenia or be an info don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love wait well some of you may have read ghore baire by rabindranath the home and the world you know there also there was a big discussion about whether women should go out of the homestead you know the the house the protective place now sitting on the wall is very very dangerous for patriarchy if a woman sits on the wall that is the boundary between the home and the outside world the woman can very easily jump either in or out if the woman jumps in she will remain at home protected or confined depends on your perspective if she goes out she will become a bad woman because patriarchy does try to keep her in a tight leash i have already talked about the three names but at the same time just as the woman persona is told not to peep at uh, sorry sit on the wall she is also told not to peep into the rooms through the lace draped windows 
The windows are draped with laces, curtained. Why? Because the woman is not supposed to see many things. Do they keep it in mind? Because I will have to come back to this. A man has his needs. It is often said. Sexual desire is something that is denied to women, but that is condoned in men. Okay. Uh, be me, be, be, be Kamala, better still uh, be Madhavi Kutti and then read. It is time to choose a name, a role. Don't because blame you are, before. Because you are a woman, you have to choose the name. And you have to play the role, perform the role of the wife, the mother, the caregiver, and the stay at home. Yes, go on. Don't play pretending games. Yes, don't play pretending games like writing or writing in English or trying to put on male attacks. Don't try to fight us. If you are present, if you are if you are tolerant, if you are if you accept the Dictates of you, uh, patriarchy, you will be accommodated, you will be accepted, you will be played uh, in one of uh, uh, Rabindranath's poems, Mukti. The woman says, Taito Shabai Bole, I am Loki Shoti, Halo Manus Oti. So if you actually follow the dictates of patriarchy, you will be Loki Shoti, Halo Manus Oti. You will be accepted. You will be praised. So that the price of praise from patriarchy is unquestioning acceptance of the social norms, cultural norms. Okay, go on. Don't play at schizophrenia or be a nympho. Yes, you should not be desirous. You should not desire other men, even though your man can desire other men, because they have their needs. And you are not even supposed to cry embarrassingly loud when you are jilted in love. Now, because it is a marital context, you have to understand that being jilted in love can mean two things. Apparently, it can mean when you are neglected. It can mean that uh, the woman figure may be neglected. But most importantly, it can mean infidelity from the husband figure. And at this juncture, if we refer to my story that I had refer, uh, actually uh, mentioned in the second slide, it was published in 1977. It is a memoir. A very controversial memoir. Now, in that particular um, text, Kamala Das had pointed out that often her husband used to talk about sexier women and even flaunt his homosexual. He would draw a youth, uh, another male, into the room and shut the door. And so, sexual picadillos were very common for the male folk. But you know, the woman is not supposed to have any desire. If he desires, again, legalized prostitution, you know, the female sexuality has to be controlled. It has to be reserved for the male, for the husband only. Her male. No other no the other man. But again, the woman person is a tigress. She fights. Let's go to the next slide. Love's ecstasy.
Yes, go to read. So slide has not been changed yet. Shunandita, you have to change the slide, please. Yes, I met a man, loved him. Call him not by any name. He is every man who wants a woman, just as I am every woman who seeks love. Wait. I meet a man, not the man, not the husband, a man, indefinite article, loved him. So you can very easily understand that in marriage, she did not get love. Now she comes out of the cocoon. She dares to come out. Like Nora in doll's house, he comes out of the home space. Dares to love a man. Becomes adulterous, maybe. Like Hester Klein in, in the Scarlet Letter. But she tells us not to actually identify or categorize that particular male. Life. Don't call him by any name. For a change, this request is from the woman speaker and not an instruction from the categorizers. Call him by no name. He is every man who wants a woman. Every man, that means any man. Just I am every woman who seeks love. Now here, there is a subtle thing that we should point out to ourselves as readers. The man only requires a woman. The woman on the other hand seeks love. The desire is not only physical. It is a psychological desire for understanding. But my dear students, do you think in this particular society she can get that particular kind of understanding? Let's see. Okay, move on. In him, the hungry haste of rivers. In me, the ocean's tireless waiting. So in a way, it is a hint at sexual act. But is it only that? The hungry haste of the river is counterpointed by the patient waiting on the ocean. Okay. On, one, on the one hand, it alludes to the active male and the passive female. But at the same time, don't you think it also alludes to an intellectually more advanced female? Remember this. She is not only a person. She is also possessed of the exemplastic imagination as Kori would have us believe. She is a poet. She is intellectually, psychologically, spiritually more mature than the lover figure. Let's go on. Who are you? I ask each and every one. The answer is, it is I. Wait. Now, what is the title of this particular slide? A male prerogative. Yes. The male figure has always certain prerogatives, certain rights that are denied to women. Who are you? Who asks the woman speaker? So whom? Obviously the um, uh, male figure, the third he, the lover figure. 
Now, this lover figure, at one time, the woman had said, don't call him by any name. Because then, it was only the first rapture of the first ecstasy of love. But now, there is some kind of feelings. A need for moving your affections. And that's why she asks, who are you? The answer is always, it is I. Obviously, a male I. Because the person who asked the question is the woman. And the person who is asked the question is the, the man. So this I is a male I, very confident, culturally accommodated, promoted, go on. Anywhere and everywhere, I see the one who calls himself I in this hey, world. Look, 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 look. This is a very important thing. Here, the woman speaker deliberately uses the male reflexive pronoun himself. So the fact that we consider that I as male I is correct. That male I, the lover I, is part of the Male. So they are treated society by culture in a particular way. They deny to women. Now, this is something you have to understand. From the very beginning, who had power? Who wielded the power? People like Nehru, people like the father figure, he people like the husband figure he, people like the lover figure he, and even the categories. Whether they were all male is not important. They were all imbued with, they were all co-opted by patriarchal values, patriarchal norms, patriarchal perspective. Okay, go on. In, the, uh, in this world, he is tightly packed like the sword in its sheath. Now, Torwal, Torwal and Kha. So he is tightly packed. He is comfortably accommodated by society. So, in any encounter between the woman eye and the male man eye, between the female eye and the Male I, the I who met a man and loved him, and the I who wants a woman, any woman, there is some kind of difference of status. We'll come to that in the next slide. Please. Now, what is this uh, site titled? From alienation to assertion. Yes, from alienation to assertion. So, let's see whether the title is correct or not. Read. It is I who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns. Wait. It is I. Wait, wait, wait. It is I who drink lonely drinks in hotels of strange towns, not at home, in hotel, not in hometown, but in strange towns, not in the evening, but at midnight. And not together, but lonely. So, the person, the woman speaker, who have dared to come out of protective cocoon of home and heart, of family, 
has now to pay the price for his heart humanity. She has to drink, only drinks. Now she even rejected or left or abandoned by the male. That is what we come to understand or guess at any rate. He has gone. It is I who laugh. It yes, is I this is a, this is, just wait. Who laughs? When do you laugh? Do you only laugh? Do you only smile when you are happy? Tum itna kyun muskura rahe ho? Kya gam hai jisko chupa rahe ho? Goes the famous song. So there is a marvelous green. Why? Why does the woman speaker laugh? Because she has seen through the first act. She has, she has seen through the discriminations that she being a woman is subjected to. I make love and then feel shame. So if when I actually dare to go against patriarchy by making love, by desiring, by asserting my identity and my will, we can only feel shame. Now, shame is, you can very easily understand, Shame is a social construct, yes or no? Something that is shameful in one society may not be shameful in another society. You think about dress, you think about dress, you think about culture. You can easily understand what I, I, I'm trying to point out. Yes, feel shame and, and then go on. It is I who lie dying with a rattle in my throat. Yes, ultimately, when I go, want to go against society, what will happen? I will have to lie dying because I will be ostracized and going to go to the way. So I will be strangulated. I will be silenced. The woman figure will be silenced. So it is I, that female I, who has to bear the brunt of social categorization. And lie dying with a rattle in our throat. Yes, go on. I am sinner, I am saint. I am the beloved and the betrayed. So I am sinner. Again, the female eye. I am sinner. When I go out of the house, I am sinner. Who decides society? I am saint. When I stay at home and remain quote unquote faithful to my man, I am saint. So who decides? Gita Hitar Vichar Gare Ki. Gita Hitar Raj. So obviously, the Matobbar, the power, those in power, again, I am the beloved. And the betrayed. Here also. Based on whether I am a sinner or a saint, I will be treated accordingly by society. Here, I.G. Ahmed has pointed out the use of the deverbal adjective. Beloved. Somebody who is loved. Ed, this verbal adjective. So, I, if I am a beloved, that means somebody is again I'm being passive or betrayed. Again, somebody is betraying me. So, if I am a saint, I can be loved. If I am a sinner, I can be betrayed. But the problem is the problem that the the, the 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 deviousness of patriarchy in this context is that. Whether I am beloved or betrayed will not be decided 
exclusively whether I am a sinner or a saint. Then if I am a saint, if I, I keep to my home, my husband, my heart, my children, I may be betrayed. Understood? But again, I'm telling you, and this is something, if you go on reading Kamala Das, you will see that Kamala Das or the woman speaker is nothing. It's not racist. Or, I have no joys that are not yours, no aches which are not yours. I too call myself I. I have no joys which are not that are not yours, no sorrows that are not yours. So you have to understand. Now he is arguing with society, with culture, with patriarchy. Now we have the common humanity. Our joys are same. Our sorrows are same. Our desires, our fears are same. And I call myself I. Even though I uh, am not given the privileges that the male I get, I to call myself I. So I have an identity. That is the assertion. But on another level, that can be a call to female agency. I too call myself I. This is the line from an introduction. It is not the end, it is the beginning. So ultimately, it may be token the beginning of a new phase for Indian women, for Indian women poets, for Indian poets in uh, Indian women poets in English. So in a way, in this way, an introduction becomes a kind of a manifesto both poetic and, in some ways, even political. Because even though Kamala Das hated categorization like feminists, he was trying to champion, she was trying to champion women's rights. But rights always entail some kind of responsibilities, we know. And the responsibility, the burden that the female speaker has to bear in order to be understood, in order to be respected, in order to be accommodated, is prestige and also self-respect. And that is why I too call myself I. Well, I have, to the best of my ability, like to uh, discuss the poem. I know it is very difficult to make sense of the poem. It is a, a longish poem of 61 lines. So I think discussion could be continued. But at back, I always hear time swinged chariot hurrying near. So I stop and expect questions and comments. Over to you, Devan. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's really a uh, captivating session for us, and it is very hard almost impossible to draw a conclusion because we have to draw a conclusion uh, after the end of such discussion. But sir, uh, frankly speaking, we are eager to hear you long. But once again, it's the time, the uncompassionate regulator of our life, which restricts us. Every word I shall utter or every 
pause i shall take uh, would surely mar the chant that you have cast on us but if i am to say something if i have to say something that the poem as marks the double standardness of patriarchy it is not a poem as you have said it's an utterance it's not an utterance it's a declaration it's the beginning of something sir you have at the same time encapsulates and de encapsulates the very poem the entire poem the the very spirit of it in just one line the poem is a record of a life of a woman penned by a woman the poet komala das poetizes how he sees and how he is seen how he thinks and how he is thought of patriarchy deliberately creates an illusion of protection but actually it exploits the rights and living of the females uh, that's uh, a very minimum uh, effort from my uh, uh, from my end i can't say long after your such captivating dis uh, discussion and i uh, open the session for question and answer session and so i think we should we should start minding the false impression that uh, time always creates that we have plenty first of all and it's already uh, uh, 931 and we must not waste time first of all conforming to the weather outside at kamarpukur where i am at present a sunny good morning to one and all however i am quite unsure of the weather of the different parts of the state where from we proud to have our interested audience i want to introduce myself i am devan banerji assistant professor and head department of english chai pat sohid pradut bhattacharya mahavidyalay on behalf of the department and the college i heartily welcome you all today is a day one of our online lecture series entitled text in focus 2021 we are pleased to inform you that our respected tic ma'am has already joined us other teaching non teaching staffs are also there with us so are our most beloved students thank you all today we are thrilled to have in our midst professor amit bhattacharya head department of english university of gorbongo sir is my research supervisor sir will deliver lecture on an introduction a representative poem of komala das we are quite lucky that from his busy schedule sir has managed time for us sir has done his masters and his phd from the university of north bengal the title of his dissertation was the poetics of resistance a study of marginal voices in the poetry of komala das so it's almost self evident that we heartily requested sir to deliver at least one lecture on the poem sir has over 20 years of experience in teaching and research he has attended quite a number of seminars and conferences at the national and international levels and contributed more than 30 articles to journals and anthologies of critical articles in india and abroad the areas of his research interest include marginality studies stoma studies and intersectionality studies he has received the prestigious sikharodno uh, award in 2019 from the government of west bengal in recognition of his contribution to the field of higher studies and higher education yeah so there is a question from uh, novida anjum uh, he wants to ask uh, how we should uh, address komala das a feminist writer or a post colonial writer uh, based on the poem you have discussed now in a way you know uh, it is it is very difficult and even counterproductive to categorize uh, creative writers because they, they are not critics hmm. yes komala das in her poetry 
has shown many facets of uh, feminist as well as post colonial stances you know so there are certain colonial the issues uh, that can be discussed from post colonial perspective and there are other issues that are actually very easily discussed from a feminist perspective now you have to understand something what is the an indian writer a woman writer a dravid writer so she was marginalized and she was also a writer from the third world so obviously she has concerns that coincide with the feminist those of the feminists and those of the post colonial writers and post colonial critics okay sir thank you sir so there is another question from sahana parvin our student from 6th semester yes uh, see uh, wants you to elaborate once more the concept of autogenography yes good autogenography my dear friend you have to understand is a kind of a new concept mooted by domna stanth it is in a way similar to but different from autobiography we all know that in autobiographies it is the person whose life is being recorded is the recorder so if i am writing about my own life it becomes a kind of an autobiography or atto jiboni here jiboni is important and an atto is also important now what donna stanton in her uh, uh, book the female autograph has pointed out is that you know in most cases autobiography is in some ways a construct you know here the self being talked about and the self talking about mane je je likhche এবং যাকে নিয়ে লেখা হচ্ছে সে যেহেতু এক তাই দ্য পার্সন এন্ড দ্য ক্যারেক্টার ইন দ্য অটোবায়োগ্রাফি ইট ইস অ্যাজুম দেয়ার সেলস আর ইউনিফর্ম এন্ড ইউনিক ইউনিটারি এক ও ভিন্ন এবং ইন দ্য ওয়ে it can be it can be divided kintu mohilader khetre ki hoy tader je to onek gulo role sobshomoy play korte hoy ei mohilader lekhay eta kintu sobshomoy bola hoyeche virginia woolf theke shuru kore cement de bobo sobai kintu ekta kotha bar bar boleche je mohilader lekhay jehetu tader onek gulo role play korte hoy tai tader je conception of self that becomes diffused সেই জন্যই টু অ্যাকোমোডেট দ্যাট ডিফিউজনেস দ্যাট ডোমনা স্ট্যান্টন টক্স দিস কনসেপ্ট অফ অপোজিট অফ এন অ্যানাদার রিলেটেড টার্ম টু মুটেড বাই পোস্ট কলোনিয়াল স্পেশালি পোস্ট কলোনিয়াল ফেমিলিস্ট ক্রিটিক টেস্টিমোনিও দ্যাট ইজ আ কাইন্ড টেস্টিমোনি but you know because women's lives are affected in more fundamental ways by outside world i outside forces because they are more vulnerable in some ways their conception of self is different from that of of their male counter I hope you are getting my point, Miss Parvin. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think you have quite elaborated it uh, with example, uh, very common to our daily life. So there is another question from our faculty, Asit Kumar Bera, and okay. it's a question uh, quite philosophical. It sounds <coughs> to me 
as it introduction what is the conclusion pardon as it introduction what is the conclusion i mean uh, if the name is an introduction uh, how we should conclude or uh, how the poet wants the journey to be concluded now you know rubindranath has a very famous song pothir shesh kothay shesh kothay ki ache tar sheshe nobody knows Kolkata didn't know, didn't claim to know, but with the advancing years, she evolved as a poet. And I will refer you, refer Ashit Babu to a poem like composition. You know, Kamala Das in composition has suggested one kind of concept. she has craved the freedom to discompose not decompose not to rot but to leave the potent fragments of her individuality of her life to quicken new birth so we say she didn't crave for dissolution shesh hoye jak chandi নতুন শুরু হোক সুমনে সেই গানটা আছে না সন্ধে নামার একটু আগে পশ্চিমে নয় পূবের দিকে মুখ ফিরিয়ে ভাববো আমি কোন দেশে রাত হচ্ছে ঠিক আছে with permission with uh, sats permission i request susmita banerji or susmita dim uh, to give vote of thanks susmita dim please over to you okay uh, good morning everyone it's an honor me to have been asked to offer a vote of thanks in this session in this online session um named um text in focus 2021 20 and uh, on behalf of my college and my um, from the faculty um, department of english i am expressing my gratitude to our guest mr amit bhattacharya head of the department english gurbango um, vishwavidyalaya and for sharing his graceful words with us and we have been honor very much fortunate to have him with us and uh, who for today session who throws a clear light on the um, on kamala das uh, and i take this opportunity or occurrence to thank you thank our uh, tic ma'am um, sila ma'am sila chakraborty madam for representing his valuable views and leading supervision and um, i must remark a um, projection uh, project gratefulness uh, to iqac internal uh, quality assurance cell for their consent and their continuous supports and i want to extend my generous thanks to monoj bhoumik and ujjwal choudhury sir for helping technically conduct technically um, uh, technically to conduct our session and i am also thankful to all the participants and our beloved students um, for attending the session and once again i would like to state that we are glad to have our speaker and thank you for being with us thank you and have a great day ahead thank you susmita ji thank you thank you everyone for your valuable time thank you sir uh, i think we call it a day sir and here we end the session stay safe all as always thank you thank you everyone